I'm Daniel Ruiz, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years, and today I have my special guest. He's the author of several books, no other than Mr. John Paladino. Thank you for having me, Daniel. Yes, welcome back, Mr. John. And last week we talked about the first book of your series, the the tragedy of Sidain. So let's do the recap before we go to the up uh, your upcoming book, and I hope it will become bestseller. <laughs> That would be great. <laughs> Trial of Asma. Let's uh, do the recap of what we talk about. So I, I mean, we went over the uh a few of the characters the main characters uh the five main characters in book one and then uh we talked about a few of the reviews and i guess my upcoming plans which include uh buzzard's bowl wow so how did you connect uh buzzard's bowl to your first book Uh so the trials of Ashmount kind of ends like on a cliffhanger it doesn't like wrap up so this book takes place like right after the end of that book so it didn't take much work to connect it because it's directly right after there's it's not like it, you couldn't read book two without reading book one it wouldn't work I don't think so they are a standalone novel no it's a continuous series Oh okay, but I can read the book one by not connecting the book two. You could. I don't know if you'd be happy with it though, because not everything is resolved in the first book. In fact, uh, there's a lot that's like resolved in book two. I guess. I mean, book two still doesn't end in like a super wrapped up way. I think it does end with like kind of less. Uh, cliffhangers maybe than the first book but uh, I, w- I wouldn't recommend like only reading one or two of these books and then not continuing it if you care about like a whole story because I don't think that anyone looking for a wrapped up story is going to get that until I finish the last book okay the boss search ball will be published on June 1 right yes but did you send a uh, free copy for those read uh, in advance yeah I, I sent uh, uh, I think it was roughly around 30 35 I don't remember exactly but I sent them to interested reviewers and yes because I saw on my uh, Twitter uh, feeds and He said, oh, you need to read this Blossard Ball one of a kind. And they're saying, what the F? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? What, uh, you put, what are the elements you put in the story that make your readers, oh, what, what the F? <laughs> um, I think there's a, there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, I think that book two, for one, just is like way better than book one. I learned a lot after writing the first book. There's a new character, a new main character in book two. Uh, a lot of people seem to like her so far. And uh, my number one goal when I write is I really want to shock and surprise people. I want to give them, you know, that feeling of like, oh, wow, I did not see that coming at all. And so I think there's a lot of that in book two. Uh, and, and I think that this, there's just a couple specific events. I, obviously, I can't say what they are because of spoilers, but uh, I think that they really kind of shook people up, and I'm glad. <laughs> yes, I think, yes. It's, I was surprised. He said, Mr. Jen told me that it will be June 1. What? So I mean to say you did uh, send me. free copies for uh, for the advanced reading. So Bossard's Bowl, how did you craft it? Uh, so I just 
kind of started writing right after I finished the first book. Uh, I took I took a break to finish editing the first book because I don't want to write while I'm editing. I find that very difficult. So I waited until The Trials of Ashman was edited, and I started writing Buzzard's Bowl. And while I was waiting for things like uh, formatting and uh, different cover stuff and other behind the scenes stuff to get the trials of Ashman out there. I was working on writing Buzzard's Bowl and uh, I didn't really do anything special. I don't think I just kind of went at it and wrote and I was really into this uh, specific story for all five of the main characters. And uh, I just, I was able to write this book really fast. I think I started writing it in uh, January, the middle of January, and I stopped writing Buzzard's Bowl. Uh, I think it was sometime in July, uh, which is pretty quick for 150,000 words, I suppose, uh, for some people. I know other people can write like, you know, a million words in that time. I am not one of those people. I, I did not really enjoy writing the first book that much, honestly. But I I really enjoyed writing book two. I had a lot of issues with, uh, like, the first book. Okay, so, Bossers Bowl, what behind the title of your second book of your series, Tragedy of Sedane? Okay, so in... Uh... In the series, you have Ash Mount, which is the, the first book, which is all about the magical school. And then you have Buzzard's Bowl. And Buzzard's Bowl is the name of a gladiator arena. It's actually a magical gladiator arena. So uh, the, the mages that are around can kind of do different things with the arena. And uh, so the cover art, if uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's ships in water and in the background you can actually see the wall of uh the arena it kind of looks reminiscent to the uh coliseum i think uh and that's because the ships are not actually at sea they're in a gladiator arena it's set up to be like a, a simulation almost of a war at sea i guess or a battle at sea between two ships wow yes i i saw it the cover of evil it's so one of a kind interesting that's why the people say what the f <laughs> 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 uh, okay i can understand i can feel their uh uh intense feeling when they describe your book so i uh, mean to say that they this are magician battling each other i don't want to do spoiler but is it uh the way i my idea uh the, the you're portraying on your cover are the magician uh fighting each other or they oh uh, okay no they're not fighting each other it looks kind of like they might be uh but really they're in the uh sky kind of controlling things like uh the weather and uh, other elements of the battle to keep uh, the gladiators on their toes almost. Uh, in the cover art, you see the ships are circling each other. And the reason that they're doing that is basically because the mages are controlling it. It's not really spelled out in the book that way, but that is the idea. Mm, yes, sounds interesting. It's just like one of the scene of Harry Potter that they're fighting each other, but it's not people. <laughs> Right, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so, Buzzard's Bowl, what do you think the flaws? The flaws of Buzzard's Bowl? Uh, I think that... So, in my first book, I think there was kind of like action scenes and then uh, some downtime and then more action scenes and then downtime. And I don't know if this is completely true because i haven't really looked at buzzard's bowl for a while now but if i'm going based on my memory it's kind of a lot faster like paced 
there's a lot more yeah. happening. I feel like I don't feel like there's as much downtime. Uh, so if you're somebody who doesn't like constant like things happening, uh, you might not like Buzzard's Ball as much. But um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I feel like each person's different. I suppose I like really action-packed stories myself, so I write that way. But I also know that some people are like either not so much into action or they're more into, uh, you know, maybe a story that just has action, but doesn't have like a ton of it. And that's fine. I just, for some reason, book two had a lot going on. And so there's a lot of action. I would also say another weakness would be if you like poetic prose, I think I mentioned this with the first book as well. Uh, don't, don't read my writing. I'm, I'm a very simple prose writer. Uh, I think I, I like to think that I'm funny and clever and witty. I don't know if uh, everyone would think I am, but I like to think, you know, I am. And so I try and inject some humor into it because it's a, it's a dark book. It's a dark story. And the characters, while being, you know, uh, screwed over or being evil, they also you know have these funny thoughts sometimes in the narration or in their mind or whatever and i don't yeah. know if everyone would appreciate that that's kind of how i live my life in general yes you cannot please everybody mr john but you're a one of a kind because you created this fantasy that people want to read saying what the f Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so people out there, yeah, uh, let's support Mr. John this coming June one because Buster's Ball is one of a kind. Do you agree, Mr. John? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's one of a kind. Uh, I don't know, you know, you might read it and think what's original about this, and I would say I think that I have, you know some unique characters. Um, I guess really no character is truly unique, but uh, I try. And then I would say I have a very unique magic system. So Definitely. if you like, if you like a unique magic system, I actually have two magic systems that are different. I think that one of them is really unique and the other one uh, might not be as unique. I think that's been done before maybe. But I, 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 I truly don't know. So let's talk about the main character of the Bossers Fall. What can you say about it? Uh, well, there's technically five main characters, but uh, Buzzard's Bull does focus more on one character. Uh, it's a, I suppose it's a very slight spoiler to say the name of the character, but uh, I. You know, if you if you uh, are listening to this and you find that knowing the name of a main character is a spoiler, then uh, perhaps just give ahead a second or two because uh, I'm about to drop their name, uh, and so then you'll know that you know he doesn't survive and or he does survive in book one. But Edelbrock is a nobleman. He was in the first book. He gets. Uh, he gets betrayed in the first book. And the first book is kind of his... Uh, uh, this is, again, going to be kind of slight slight spoilers for the plotline of Trials of Ashmount. Uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it vague so that it's not like going to ruin anything. But he gets uh, betrayed in the first book, imprisoned, and uh, that's kind of his journey through the first book is uh, getting betrayed, trying to survive in this inhospitable environment in this terrible place and, and he's he's told he's going to be fighting in this arena and uh then this book really kind of focuses on a lot of like that fighting yes very well said mr chan but before we go on i want to shout out to the people listening in japan hi Thank you so much for supporting this podcast in Tokyo. I got 69%. Thank you so much. Miyazaki, Gifu, Nara, Aichi, 
wakayama yogo kumamoto kanagawa last but not the least hokkaido oh thank you so much japan for supporting this podcast once again arigato saimasu And thank you for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world, like Mr. John Palladino. So, Mr. John, what is the best highlight of Bossard's Bowl? I really like the new main, one of the new main characters.、Uh, there's a couple other side characters that are new that are pretty great too, I think. But.、Uh, I'd say the new character is a huge highlight. And I, I just honestly, I think the writing in the story is way better than the first book, just overall. And I kind of think it's more interesting. But I guess that's subjective. According to Amazon, your book is categorized to a dark fantasy horror, dark fantasy, and epic fantasy. Right. How, why, is, why your book is categorized on that、uh, category? It's a good question because I don't actually know when you upload a book, it kind of automatically puts you into things.、Uh, I mean, I, I did pick, you're supposed to pick like the three、uh, categories, I think, that like most、yes. fit the book. And then they slot you into a bunch of like other categories like that are associated with that, I think. Because like I wouldn't call my book Stark Fantasy Horror, but both of them are under that.、Uh, but when you click on Dark Fantasy Horror, And you see some of the other books there.、Uh, I, I guess it matches up with some of them.、Uh, some of them, you know, there also seems to be a lot of romance and dark fantasy for some reason. But、uh, so, but then you also see Joe Abercrombie. And I would say my books line up with Joe Abercrombie quite a bit.、Uh, is, it, is it dark fantasy? I would say、uh, probably. The thing that's really annoying about Amazon is they don't have a category for like grim dark.、Um, and dark fantasy to me typically feels like a different genre than grim dark, but、uh, you know, that's okay. And then I, I would say it also fits into epic fantasy, I suppose, as well. But you know, I don't know. I, it's annoying because you don't really get like. The most like super good control over what categories display on your book. For example, I'll tell you a quick story about what happened with the Trials of Ashmont the other day. So, the three categories that show up on the book when you go to the Amazon book,、uh, they change. And so, I sold a lot of books the other day. And for some reason, one of the three categories on the Trials of Ashmont changed to military fantasy. And military fantasy is actually a smaller category than like epic fantasy or dark fantasy. So it's really a lot easier to move up in the ratings、uh, or the rankings, rather. And so I was selling a bunch of books and I was in the top 100 for military fantasy. And I kept seeing it go up and up and up and up. And it got up to about、uh, 21, I think I was at. And I was super excited because I kept selling books. And I was like, oh man, I'm going to make number one, I think. And then for some, I don't know what happened. But they changed the three categories that you could click on, and military fantasy was no longer there. So I manually went to the military fantasy、uh, rankings. My book wasn't even in the top 100 anymore, despite selling a whole bunch、uh, more after I saw it on number 21. And so I, I don't know what happened there, but it was really annoying because I wanted to hit number <laughs> one in that category. And、yes. I don't know what they did. But、uh, I felt cheated. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're number 26 right now.、Uh, uh, Trials of Ashman. And、uh, as right now, you are number 26 on the Amazon bestseller、uh, military fantasy. Oh, am I showing up on military fantasy again? Y- yes. See, I, yeah, I see it now on there too.、Um, That's weird. I don't, I don't understand <laughs> that because it's <laughs> so weird. It makes no yes, sense. Uh, we are crossing our finger that you will be number one on the Amazon bestseller military fantasy because you deserve it. <laughs> Instead of people, <laughs> just like the Bastard Ball, they say, What the F? 
Okay, so let's wait for June 1. What will be the comments of your avid readers? So, uh, Mr. John, uh, what if you describe your writing, what is it? Honestly, don't write with like a specific uh, goal in mind other than I'm aiming to get people to be able to digest the book easily and read it quickly. So I use pretty simple language. Uh, I've been told that the simplicity actually really helps people uh, form images in their minds. Uh, I've heard that the simple descriptions and I don't linger on describing different things. I like to move through descriptions pretty quickly because uh, as a reader myself, if we linger too long on descriptions, I start to kind of glass over and I don't really internalize everything I'm reading because I get bored of just all these descriptions, I guess. Uh, but I know some writer or some readers that really like that, and that's great. I just myself can't read that and be too happy. I just can't focus. So I really kind of wanted to aim that way, you know, simple, digestible, easy for people that English isn't their nat native language as well. I know a lot of uh, reviewers who read the book and uh, they don't, you know, English is in the first language. And so when you get too complicated with stuff, uh, it, it makes it harder for people that didn't, you know, aren't 100% english language to read and digest it so uh that's just that was a happy accident i didn't actually think about that when i was writing the first book but ever since i have published and have seen how many reviewers uh don't speak english uh as their number one language or or read it there's a lot of people that uh read english books because uh, apparently in quite a few countries it's the fantasy in their native language is not really a thing which again i did not know that unless it gets translated uh, i guess there's not a lot of like writers that uh, write fantasy in some of these other languages and so they're kind of forced to read english fantasy and knowing that now i try and uh be a bit more conscientious about uh writing things that are digestible but that's kind of my natural way of going about it anyway Yes, very well said, Mr. John. But before we go on, I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast, Food 101, on our third season with Chef Alessandro, one of the executive chef in one of the five-star hotel in downtown Toronto. So please do listen to our latest episode. We talk about butter chicken, people, plus one more, my upcoming new podcast with Mr. Mike Lucas, Comedy 101. It is all about being a comedian and how to uh, learn how to laugh and to be entertained to other people. So please do listen this coming June, uh, Comedy 101. So Mr. John, are you in the author? Or, you're in the author, right? Yep. Yep. I am. So we, we talk about last week, what is, are the pros and cons of indie publishing? So do you think that in the future, uh, you can go to traditional publishing? Uh, I can't predict that, obviously. I would like to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my goal when I started writing was always to get traditionally published. Uh, when I finished The Trials of Ashmount and started to look around for agents, uh, I got really frustrated because each agent has different uh, requirements. And so you'd apply, like you'd query this agent and they'd want like a synopsis of the book. So you'd write that, you'd get it all where you wanted it to go. You'd send that email out. And then you looked at this agent. They don't want that. They want you to write uh, this, a summary about, you know, whatever. And so when I started to see that each agent kind of had their own uh, different requirements, I kind of got like not, I, I got really bored <laughs> of uh, submitting, <laughs> honestly. I'm not very good at doing that. So, and I also know that the wait time is like ridiculous and I, I don't really want to wait. Uh, 
you know, half a year. I had this book. I wanted to get it out there. So I did send a few emails out, uh, mostly got rejections. Uh, a couple ignored me, never, never sent me an email. I still haven't heard from them. Uh, I know that agents are really busy, so I'm not really surprised by that. Uh, recently, I did send to another agent who is active on Twitter. Uh, he hasn't responded yet either. So I don't know. Maybe I'm just not destined for traditional publishing or maybe one day in the future. I don't know. I would love to, though. I, I hate doing all of the uh, back end stuff. I really hate having to worry about uh, finding an editor and a cover artist and, and paying them and then trying to find someone to do different services. Like, I don't have the program to format the book, so I have to get someone to do that and manage all the stuff online. It, it would just be so much easier for me if I could find a publisher willing to do all that stuff. But uh, you know what? If I have to do it myself, I will do it myself. Yes, definitely. So you are comfortable enough to be an indie author. Yeah, I, I don't mind being an indie author. I think it's uh, I think there's a lot of good indie authors out there, and uh, in many ways, you can make more money that way too. I don't. Yes, I don't definitely. Know if you're doing well, yeah. Definitely. So, what are you aspiring for those aspiring writers out there? They want to publish their stories. Well, if you want to go the traditional route, I wish you the best of luck. I don't have many words to tell you because I did not uh, do much there. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I, you know, I tried querying a few people and got nowhere. If you are going the self-published route, I will say that uh, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, plenty of authors will answer any questions you have. And uh, if you, if you want to self-publish, I can't recommend enough that you hire an editor and you get good cover art because there's a lot of, you know, haphazard uh, kind of thrown together in a week type books out there, unfortunately, which don't do well. And then the author is kind of surprised. So, you, you know, you got to put the effort into it. And if you're willing to put the effort into it, there's a lot of support out there. Get on Twitter and you will find plenty of people willing to uh, give your book a shot. Or maybe they're not willing to give your book a shot, but they want to invite you on a podcast and interview you. Yes, just like my <laughs> podcast, people. <laughs> my podcast is created to empower writers all over the world. So you are welcome to come and visit me. And it's totally free, people. And so, Mr. John Bossers Ball, if you want to revise the book, which part of the book you want to revise? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, if I wanted to revise it, what would I revise? So I made a, I will, this is a, not a spoiler because I'm not going to tell you what happened, but there's a choice I made in one of the last chapters uh, that I, I regret making. Uh, because I, I don't, I don't like that it happened, <laughs> uh, but it makes a lot of sense with the way that the story went. So if I was going to revise it, <laughs> I might go back and change. I mean, I wouldn't really. Uh, I think it's good the way it is, but um, I it, there's just one moment in the book that I keep thinking like, why did I do that? And and everyone that finishes the book is like, why why did you do this? <laughs> like. You know, it was hard and I, I didn't necessarily want to, but I felt like I had to because if I didn't, I didn't feel like I would be uh, being true to the story and the characters. And I just felt like these characters would make these decisions. And so unfortunately, it ended with something happening that I do kind of regret, but that's okay. Yes. So what are the elements you put in the story that make your readers glued to it? Uh, I think that the, uh, the first thing is, I think, the surprising nature of the book. 
Uh, I think not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing who's safe and who's going to die, I make a pretty strong effort to make it obvious from the very beginning of the series that you don't really know who's going to live or die. And uh, a lot of people seem to really like that. I would also say that I I think I have pretty good characters that are unique and different and have different voices. And I'd also say my magic system is really cool and different. Yes, definitely. So, uh, people, let's support Mr. John Palladino. Mr. John, can you please invite our listeners again to buy your upcoming book or your books that are available right now? Yes, please go buy my books. <laughs> the Trials of Ashmount on uh, Kindle is only 99 cents. So it's not, it's not a bad deal. It's not a bad deal, people. So let's work. I just, it, it's not available uh, uh, in hardcover or on hardcover or paperback. The Trials of uh, Ashmount? Yes. Yeah, Trials of Ashmount paperback is seventeen ninety nine, and the hardcover is twenty four ninety nine. Yes, so let's support Mr. Uh, John Palladino because the books are so phenomenal. And we're going to say, what the F? Okay, people? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. John, thank you for your time. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you for having me again, Daniel. I appreciate it. Yes, for the second, uh, for the third book and the fourth book, you are free to come by and promote your book. Awesome. All the books. And more to come, people. See you soon.